Hi everyone, I'm Farnoosh. Uh, I'm one of the co-presidents of Other Society um, at Shulik. Uh, my co-presidents who are here on the call with us today are Snow and NAJ. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for attending the event from Western McGill Universities, and I know we might have attendance from other academic centers as well. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, and a special thanks to McGill as well society members and someone for collaborating with us to make this wonderful event possible today. Um, we are very excited and looking forward to the talk. Uh, I wanted to talk a bit about Alzheimer Society at Schulich. Um, we are a student organization at Western Medical School and through our events, uh, we try to provide opportunities for a better understanding of history of medicine and how it has shaped medical education and how it continues to do so. Uh, the Alzheimer Society at Western was founded as a permanent historical society in the 1920s, so it's been active for more than 100 years now, um, and it was named after the Canadian Dr. William Osler, who was perceived as the ideal modern physician for his stance on importance of practical instruction in teaching medicine. And I know the majority of us are medical students, so we are benefiting to this day from this improved teaching method. Um, through our events, we try to engage with various themes in history of medicine. This year, we've had guest speakers covering topics such as history of reproductive rights uh, by Dr. Dyke and Dr. Lox. Um, uh, so it involved discussing uh, reproductive politics, narratives of population, and similar subjects. Um, and also a talk by Dr. Susan Lamb on history of mental illnesses, why do psychiatric diagnoses appear and disappear from DSM. Uh, we also had a history of medicine rounds in which students get to present the research project um, and compete for different prizes. Uh, this year, we also had a private tour of Banting House located in London, which is the birthplace of insulin, and we learned all about its discovery by Dr. Banting. Um, this year, we also tried to have collaborative events with other schools as it presents us with more learning opportunities, and the event we are having today is one such example, and we are very grateful that it's happening. Um, lastly, I wanted to thank Dr. McKellar, who is the faculty member who's been overseeing all of our events and providing support. And of course, Dr. Del Maestro for agreeing to be our keynote speaker on this very interesting talk. Uh, really appreciate you being here with us today and can't wait for the talk. So um, this is all I had to say. Uh, someone, please feel free to take it away. Well, thank you very much, Farnoosh. It's been a pleasure collaborating with you. Um, my name is Amon. I'm a second year uh, medical student at McGill, one of the co-presidents of the McGill Resource Society, alongside my friend and colleague Arjun Alkapam, who is also with us. And uh, it's been a really great pleasure. We just passed our centenary of the Ozer Society here at McGill. And uh, initially thinking, we thought, what better way to find uh, opportunities for dialogues and interinstitutional collaborations and what better name than Dr. Del Maestro who has had a fantastic career and commitment both at Western where he was the director of the Brain Tumor Center and also since he joined us at McGill and uh, with his uh, wide range of interests and uh, presence uh, we are very delighted to see uh, 61 participants and counting at our events and uh, we are very happy to see you. A brief objective about the McGill Ozer Society, uh, we've been around, uh, as I mentioned, for quite a long time. And uh, the main objectives that we have is to foster an interest in the medical humanities, in the intellectual aspects of medicine, and really showing the lineage and the connection between different fields. As medical students, we're always humbled by the contributions of our predecessors, and it's extremely important to show that interplay, and we really strongly believe in that. We have more events coming up. We have a website coming up, so we're very excited about that, and uh, we hope that you can also join us in our future events uh, that uh, we would be uh, having a pleasure of having you all. So uh, I don't want to take more of the time, so I think we can just begin by introducing our keynote speaker. It's very special for me because I'm also a student Dr. Del Maestro, so it's a double honor. Uh, Professor Del Maestro is a Canadian neurosurgeon, scientist, innovator, and the director of the Neurosurgical Simulation and Artificial Intelligence Learning Center. He has led uh, brain research laboratories at Western prior to joining McGill in 2000. With over 40 years of accumulated experiences, he has trained over 100 neurosurgical residents and fellows with a practice focused on complex neuro-oncology procedures. Dr. Del Maestro is the current chairperson of the Standing Committee of the Osler Library of the History of Medicine at McGill, and he also owns one of the largest private collections of materials related to Leonardo da Vinci in the world. Uh, a master of his books include A History of Neuro-Oncology, Sir William Osler's Leonardo da Vinci Collection, Flight, Anatomy, and Art, and his incoming book, A Relationship uh, uh, Etched in Time, Leonardo da Vinci, The Earl of Arundel, and uh, 
uh, Wankel Sauce Holler will be published by the McGill Queen's University Press. Dr. Del Maestro, thank you very much for being your keynote and the floor is all yours uh, for the lecture today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Saman and um, Farouche, uh, Arjan and all the other individuals that were involved in putting this together. I must say, uh, I'm very pleased with the, uh, the concept of uh, McGill and, uh, and uh, Western getting together as far as Oster societies. I think the more that we can do this, the more communication we can have with uh, different types of medical student societies, uh, basically across, uh, across Canada and hopefully eventually across the world will make the world a little bit better. I'm, I'm pretty uh, convinced that uh, all of us working together can, can make things a little bit better than unfortunately they, they are at this particular time period. However, what I would like to do is, is really uh, talk a little bit about Leonardo da Vinci's um, search for the soul. And really what I'm talking about is Leonardo da Vinci and the search for the soul, but it really can be expanded into the search for the composites of consciousness. So basically what we're talking about is uh, a larger sort of con concept. And the other thing is we're not really talking about a religious concept, we're really talking about something else. So when one thinks about Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Paul Valéry, a French poet, uh, said of him, what a person leaves after them are the dreams that their name inspires and the works that make their name a symbol of admiration. So really, if you think about the world as, as a poetry of some sort, to the poetry of medicine, Leonardo only contributed a very small number of uh, poems. And we're gonna talk about one little aspect of his work. To the poetry of art, Leonardo contributed a number of volumes and to the poetry of the world, Leonardo contributed whole libraries. So we're talking about a very expansive uh, contribution to the, to the world of uh, intellect. Related to Leonardo's neurological focus, really the soul, the sense of communal, one can really consider this the interpreter of our existence and the essence of our passion and in intellectual life. So an interpreter, something to do with our passion and something to do with our intellectual life. So Leonardo's question that we'll address is in which organ do the composites of consciousness reside? And we'll think a little bit about this interesting dualism question. How does matter, the brain, let's say, create the subjective experience of mind? How does that sort of miraculous thing happen? So the goals today of my presentation are to discuss some of the sources of this sort of ancient question, the knowledge base that Leonardo tapped for his personal search for the soul, and some modern concepts related to artificial intelligence, really to help us with this idea of what are the composites of consciousness. This, this story will cover about 5,000 years rather quickly. But if we start with the Egyptians, if you look on the left, the, their comments in a number of their writings relate to the heart. The actions of the arms, the movements of the legs, the motions of every other member is done according to the order of the heart that has conceived them. It is the heart that draws from the senses every judgment and the tongue pronounces that which the heart has thought. So clearly on the Egyptian mythology and concept, the heart was the most important organ. And so important that when all the other organs were placed in these special sort of jars, the heart was left in the mummy. So the lungs were removed, the liver was removed, the intestines were removed and placed in special sort of jars. However, the heart was not, it was left with the body. So why was that so? Well, the reason that was so was because in Egyptian mythology, after death, there was what is was called the weighing of the feather. The heart was weighed against a special feather of matat. So if you look here, you have 
Anubis, who is here weighing the individual's heart against this special feather. And this feather was really a symbol of truth and harmony and balance. So if that individual's heart weighed less than the feather, in other words, the individual was unburdened by evil deeds, that individual would, spirit would live for eternity. However, if that person's heart was heavy with sin and weighed more than the feather, that individual's heart would be consumed by this little instrument here, which was called the devourer. And that person's spirit would be limited from the ashes of time. So if you think about that, linking judgment to a person's heart, good or bad deeds, to his external, eternal existence after death, profoundly influence Western concepts of intellectual function, religion, and philosophy. In the Egyptian language, a picture of a lamb's heart was consistent with the concept of the soul. And in the writings, it evolved, but it was always the picture of a, of a heart. Amulets involving the heart were placed, were worn by many individuals and also were placed along with the mummy in the caskets. We're moving now to another time. Raphael, in his school of Athens, which is a fresco that's presently in the Vatican Museums, has two interesting individuals in the center. On the left, you can see Leonardo da Vinci, who is, who is represented as Plato. And we know that because he's carrying the Timaeus. On the right is another individual. There has been some concept of which particular individual he represents. My own feeling is he probably represents uh, Michelangelo, but he also represents Aristotle because he's carrying the ethics. So why is this important? Well, Plato, the teacher of Aristotle, when he was dealing with the issue of what, where this sort of consciousness resided, basically commented, the brain may be the originator, originating power of the perceptions of hearing and sight and smell and memory and opinion may come from them. And science may be based on memory and opinion when they have attained fixity. So what does this, what does it really mean? Well, in essence, there were three things associated with this concept of the soul or the concept of consciousness. There was the idea that our somehow external sensation comes into our body. Reasoning results from that information. And memory has the ability to sort of influence reasoning going back and forth and back and forth. So conceptually, three things. Information comes in through your senses. That allows you to develop some type of idea of your reality. And memory, the memory you have of what was present before allows you to sort of put that in some type of a space, some type of a three-dimensional sort of concept of what the world is really about. Now, Aristotle, on the other hand, who was Plato's most famous student, took another route. He was very involved in dissection of animals and is said to have dissected over 40 to 50 different species. Most of these, however, happened to be involving amphibians and other animals. And many of them, as he says, the brain in all animals is bloodless, devoid of veins, and naturally cold to the touch. In the great majority of animals, it has a small hollow in the center, which we now know are ventricles. This is the first time the ventricles were, were shown to exist. And so Aristotle felt the generation proceeded, and he did a, a very large number of experiments involving the sort of generation of the egg and the chick. And 
visualizing that particular generation, he comments, generation from the egg proceeds in an identical manner with all birds. So obviously he'd seen multiple different types of birds involved in this process. This point beats and moves as though endowed with life. So when, when Aristotle was examining this phenomena of watching the, the egg grow, the first thing that he visualized was the beating heart. And basically from that observation, he came to the conclusion that since one could see the beating heart first, that must be the most important aspect of our existence. That must be the initial sort of driver of our intellect and other passions. So, however, there were other opinions. Hippocrates, for example, when he was discussing the sacred disease, which was epilepsy, really came down to the opinion that the fact is that the cause of this affliction, epilepsy, as of most serious diseases was the brain. So he basically came down with the concept that it was not the heart, but the brain was involved with the vast majority of diseases that were associated with, let's say, neurological conditions. Galen, who was the surgeon to the gladiators, have had a, an immense experience with injury. And, and basically what he came up with the idea was that and he also did a number of different experiments. And he comments, when a nerve is cut, pinched, contused, or tied by a ligature, all mo motion and sensibility is suspended. So great is the power which really des descends through the nerve from its great source above the brain. For whatsoever is above the section of the nerve and continuously with the brain, this will be preserved. In other words, something was coming down from the brain. And Galen says that he agreed with Plato and Hippocrates and was contrary to Aristotle and other philosophers and believed that the brain was the source of voluntary motion and the heart was a source of another motion, which is an involuntary motion. So we had two very contradictory concepts. One being the cardiocentric concept with Aristotle by far being its most important uh, sort of supporter. And then we have the cephalocentric concept, which Plato and many other of the individuals and especially Galen was important related to that particular concept. So at the time of the Renaissance, this particular issue was still active, very active in fact. Vasari, when he was speaking of Leonardo da Vinci, commented that Leonardo was a gift from God. So in one way, conceptually being that Leonardo had a number of characteristics, beauty, grace, ability united with such a lavish abundance that every action he took, <clears throat> which he turned his attention to was so divine that it surpassed all other men. So clearly it, after Leonardo's death, there was this concept that Leonardo was an individual that had something very special and had done very special things. In other words, a gift from God. Leonardo was born out of wedlock his father had very little interest in him. And at the age of, let's say, 14 to 15, he went to work in Verrocchio's Bottega. And in that time, as a boy, he would have been involved in doing drawings of various objects that would have been present in, in the Bottega. When he was a little bit older, he would have, for example, been involved in making various paints and putting various paints together. When he was older yet, he may have helped Verrocchio deal some of the backgrounds of the paintings. And then eventually he was able to take over and do most of Verrocchio's or many of Verrocchio's um, art. And interestingly, Verrocchio felt 
after seeing Leonardo's work, the concept was that he never painted after that. Conceptually, then the idea was since Leonardo was such a better painter than he was, he decided to spend his time with sculpture and other things and not try to compete with a student. In Verace, uh, Vasari's first volume associated with uh, the life of Leonardo uh, that was published in 1550, he says, Leonardo was of heretical, a cast of mind that he, conform, he conformed with no religion whatsoever, accounting it per chance much better to be a philosopher than a Christian. You can imagine the time of the Inquisition and other issues. This certainly prevented much of Leonardo's work from being published. And in fact, Leonardo's work was not published to about 130 years after his death, predominantly related to this particular comment. Rather interestingly, in the second edition of Vasari, Vasari's Lives, Vasari took this out of the second edition. So when we think about Leonardo's sort of personal search for the soul, what I would call phase one, the experimentation part. The first time when he was in Milan, Leonardo predominantly for a really artistic purpose and initiated a series of investigations which focus on deciphering the physiology of vision and perspective. And these involved a series of anatomical experiments. This initial phase really allowed Leonardo to both integrate and visually reconstruct information that he obtained predominantly from printed sources. So the first thing that Leonardo had available to him in that time period were really printed books. In 1504, uh, Leonardo had about 160 books that were present in his library and a number of other sort of codices and written things that were not in this particular list. One that was interesting was a, was a book that Leonardo learned much of his work related to Aristotle and it was a book by Albertus Magnus. And Albertus Magnus really was aware of many of the anatomical explorations of Aristotle and wrote them down. And these concepts had a very important influence on Leonardo's anatomical exploration and his own personal search for the soul. This is the very first woodcut in which this concept of three is put together in a book. And you can see here, we have three areas within the brain, three ventricles or three sort of cells. And related to this, Leonardo used a number of sources to look into this question, the experimental question. First, when he was, when he was Dealing with this, looking at the, the concept of the area of control of, of elephants, Livy in the seventh book on the Cartilagian Wars said that many elephants were killed by their own governors, then more were killed by their own governors than the enemy. For when these beasts got enraged, the governors had a sort of with a mighty blow thrust uh, an instrument, a very sharp scalpel between the ears where the neck joins the spinal column. And that was the most rapid death that could be given to so huge a beast. So for example, during these wars with Carthage and uh, Hannibal in, in Rome, one of the abilities of the Romans was to try to get the, the elephants enraged and when they were uh, hurt, the elephants sometimes would go rogue and really destroy both sides. So this, this individual who was in control of the elephant had this instrument that was about 12 inches long. And then if this happened, he would drive it between the bottom of the skull and C1 and kill the elephant immediately. I don't seem to be quite fascinated by that idea. And then so much so that he began looking for ways of of
don't know why it's not going forward, guys. You could maybe stop sharing the screen and doing it again, that film my stream. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. Hello, everyone. All right, let's try another point. So we're back again. So if you think about it, he, conceptually there, we had a problem with the issue that here you have an elephant, this huge animal that could be killed very easily by just placing this sort of instrument between the base of the skull and C1. <laughs> So you can see even our own mythology, we, we have this sort of concept. Now, if we look at the very first page of Leonardo's work that we know that has anatomical drawings, this is it on, on the left, you sort of see it. And on the right, you see it under, under ultraviolet light. If you look at it more closely in the one corner, you see this. So here is the base, the skull. Here's the spinal cord, here's C1, here's the vertebral arteries going through. And this is Leonardo's dissection of the base of, of the skull of the frog. And Leonardo says, the frog retains life for some hours when deprived of its head and its heart and all its bowels. And if you puncture the said nerve, the spinal medulla, it immediately twitches and dies. So it, then he writes here, all the nerves of animals derive here, spinal cord. When this is pricked, the animal dies at once. Rather interestingly here on this side, Leonardo writes, not in his typical backwards writing. In other words, he's writing here with his left hand and he's writing backwards. Here he writes properly. So he writes a sense of touch, cause of motion, origin of nerves, passage for the animal power. This is directly taken out of one of the books that he was writing and he writes it down properly. Now, if you look at the back of this sort of sheet, if you look in the, in the corner here, you see another dissection of the base of the skull and many other sort of... And he writes here, the frog instantly dies when its spinal medulla, medulla oblongata, is perforated. And previously it lived without head, without heart, or any inferior organs or intestines or skin. Here, therefore, it appears lies the foundation of movement and life. So in other words, Leonardo is sort of dealing with this issue and actually does an experiment himself to try to sort out where this sort of issue associated with uh, life begins. If you look here again, this is a blow up showing again another dissection. It's difficult to know if this is the frog or maybe even a dog. And he writes here, the dog or the limb will be lost whenever the nerves are punctured. So again, multiple sort of nerves involving the uh, 
area of the brachial plexus. This is all on one page. It's almost like a cornucopia of, of information on one page. How many pages do you think are available to us from Leonardo's work at the present time? There's 5,500 plus. It's estimated this is about 50 to 60% of Leonardo's output. So that means that Leonardo would have had somewhere around 10,000 pages. Almost every page of Leonardo's work has writing and many of them also have pictures to try to explain what he's actually thinking about at the time. It's interesting to think of what else could be present on Leonardo's if we could find the other pages if they were existent. So if you look at what's happened here, the conceptual methodology Leonardo employed to carry out his scientific exploration are evident when one reconstructs this critical experiment. The location of the place in the body to be pith came from information that he had abstracted from a book in his library, Livy's account. The instrument came from Robert Valterio, another book that Leonardo had in his library. However, Leonardo had to modify the experiment. He had a different animal and a much smaller frog to deal with. He therefore had also to design his own instruments to be able to carry out the experiment. And then when Leonardo carried out the experiment to understand the anatomy, he had to sort of have a full understanding of what the anatomy at the base of the skull really looked like in a frog. And then Leonardo had to repeat the experiment a number of times to find out if it was true. So in that was part of the sort of scientific method he was using at this time. The interesting thing is that this experiment was not carried out again to about 150 years later. And Fulton interestingly had said that this is one of the first martyrs of science, but indeed Leonardo had, had used that particular model of a, of a decapitated or a pet frog much before it had been uh, worked on by other individuals like Alexander Stewart, as you see here. Now, Leonardo writing about this particular uh, sort of uh, area says, what the, soul is, <clears throat> what the soul is of nature, which is necessary to make the vital and actual instruments of suitable and necessary shapes and positions. He goes through a whole group of things. He, how necessary is the companion of nature? Where does semen come from? Where does urine come from? When, where does milk, how does nourishment proceed through the veins? Whence comes intoxication? What happens with vomiting? What is gravel and stone? When colic, et cetera. And then he comes up with an interesting comment at the end. Why is it that when compressing the arteries of a man in the neck, he falls asleep? Why is it that if you a prick on the neck, may cause a man to drop dead. So here he's moved from the frog to the human. He's made the jump conceptually from the same experiment that it carried out, that had been carried out in his, in his lab to what he had seen when he was involved in some of the battles uh, that he was uh, associated with. Now, it's interesting here that in the very, his very first sort of um, drawings related to this, you can see here, he hasn't done any dissection. All he has is the various books that he has uh, been able to read. And here, for example, if you look at this particular drawing in the center, he has the three round sort of circles that we've seen uh, in uh, previous volumes that he had in his library. But you can see here how the optic nerves course right into the um, right into the orbits. And Leonardo tries three-dimensional drawings. He moves the brain and the, the skull around in multiple different ways to try to sort of sort out what this would look like in three dimensions. And he basically comes through the concept of the information coming in to the first part, which he calls the intellectual or imperceiva. And then the second part here, the second one was really the, the sensual communal or the reasoning component in the back of the head, again, conceptually, 
was the area of memorial or memory. Now, shortly after this, Leonardo was able to get a hold of a volume that had initially been published in 1491. And in 1493, that volume was published in Italian. And that volume was associated with Modino's uh, work associated with his anatomical thesis. And I'll show you what an anatomical thesis looked like at that time. There we have, for example, the urine. Here we have the body. Here we have various parts of that. We have various sicknesses, various injuries that occurred. This is the anatomy, various other aspects. And you can see here, here's a reader who's reading information, probably from Galen or Aristotle or one of the others. There is a dissection occurring. This is probably a surgeon during the dissection. There's a number of students here. And this is the process in which dissections occurred at that particular time frame. Now, Leonardo had in his library a number of books from Avicenna, Albertus Magnus, Modino, and the French surgeon. And one of the things that was interesting about this, a number of them really had the analogy of the scalp in the, in the pia matter, the dura matter, et cetera, as, as a series of layers. And these series of layers were like peeling an onion. And conceptually, if you look at this picture here again, you can see the three little balls inside the head. This is the first time the frontal sinus is seen as any type of drawing. Leonardo here did not know what the, uh, the, what the lens looked like, but he's dealing with that. Right here at the bottom, if you look, what he's done here is he's taking this, made sort of a sagittal cut through it, and he's bounced it back. So here again, you see the three little balls, the orbital area, and the various nerves coming in. So again, he hasn't really done very much that section at this time at all, but he's begun to sort of think about what it would be if he started to do second dissections and what it would look like. This is interesting because Leonardo obviously did a number of drawings related to the skull. And um, what, what's, this particular one has been lost, but this is interesting. And in, in one of his, one of his um, sort of comments at that time, he says, have I ever seen it translated? So, Leonardo had very little knowledge of, of Latin, but he wanted that book translated on the utilities. He talks about a number of other things. And then there's two other books. Zerbe was one of uh, initial, uh, was the author of an initial sort of anatomical uh, uh, volume, as was Angelo Benedicti. And right after that, he says, get a skull. It's almost like Leonardo has, has been reading these two anatomical books and suddenly came to the conclusion that he should get a skull and start working on this himself. So what he does, he does get a skull. And he starts doing some drawings. And here he does a dissection of the skull. For the first time, you see the frontal sinus here. The maxillary sinus for the first time are shown here. And then the writing is here. The cavity of the eye sunk and the cavity of the bone that supports the cheek and that of the nose and mouth are equal depth and terminate in a perpendicular line below the sensor communal. So he begins to sort of do a number of dissections related to the skull itself. And you can do this nowadays also with our three-dimensional sort of structures. And he comments, the eye, which is called the window of the soul, is the chief means whereby the understanding may most fully and abundantly appreciate the infinite works of nature. And the ear is the second, inasmuch as it acquires its importance from the fact that it hears the things that the eye has seen. And then he begins to think about where would this, now he knows that it's this, the sense of community is in the brain, where would it be? And he uses sort of, you know, a number of di sort of concepts trying to sort of locate it. And these concepts really relate to various aspects of the mathematical work that he was doing at the time. And he comments, where the line AM is intersected by the line C6, there the median of the census is made. So if you look, this is where he's talking about, this line, and this line, this line, and this line. So he basically locates the sensor communal really in the area of the 
very close to the pituitary gland, the interval, the third ventricle in that area. He also was able to get skulls that had a number of nerves still present. You can see here, for example, you can see the optic nerves here, the cavernous sinus, meningeal vessels. And again, you can see him attempting to locate the sensor communo right in this area. And as, as an individual who spent a lot of his life dealing with brain tumors, I can tell you that if you have a tumor in that area, it significantly influences your ability to, to function in, in this world. Leonardo then really begins to think about it, the whole concept as really an army. He therefore says, therefore the joints between the bones obey the tendon and the tendon, the muscle and the muscle, the nerve and the nerve, the sensor communo and the sensor community is the seat of the soul. Memory is it stored and in perceiva in his standard of reference. And the heart is its, rather interesting, Leonardo doesn't say anything here. It's almost as though he's a little bit worried that if someone looks at his notes and contradicts Aristotle, he would be in some type of trouble. In the third phase, Leonardo really, in the third phase, he really begins very concentrated work associated with the actual brain itself. And you can see here that we have the three various circles, but now they're, they're, they're sort of uh, elongated and put into a more normal position, the multiple nerves that are involved in the eyes, the, the, uh, the uh, olfactory nerves, spinal cord, et cetera. Leonardo's bringing these all to some type of conclusion. But the other thing he attacked was that the soul appears to reside in the seat of judgment and the judicial parts appear to be where all the senses come together, which is called the central communion. And it is not in all other parts of the whole body, as many believe, but all in this part. So there are many people who believe that the actual soul is located in all kinds of different places in the body. And these just goes to show you the number of experiments that Leonardo did with the heart. And Leonardo did multiple experiments to get a better idea of, for example, how the eyes, the optic nerves, the various nerves of the cavernous sinuses and the olfactory and how they were all associated with the, the concept of information coming into the brain. And then he did some interesting experiments to really look at what the actual ventricles look like. And so what he did is he took a bovine brain and he injected, he placed into the third ventricle by going through the laminar in the bottom part of the brain here and injected wax. And the wax showed the lateral ventricles, third ventricle, fourth ventricle, the foramen of mineral and the aqueduct of Sylvia. So he had a complete sort of three-dimensional construction of what the ventricles look like in the brain. And this information at the time was something like this. This was a book that was published at about the same time of, as some of Leonardo's work in 1504. And you can see it is somewhat different from Leonardo's overall conception because he has been able to sort of actually find these particular areas inside the brain. And so this is really the area of integration. He integrates all the information he has from his various, his various amounts of work and actually works on the idea of that there is a, a chori plexus within these ventricles. And he considers the chori plexus being able to sort of adjust the amount of fluid that's flowing between these various areas. And by it change the amount of fluid, it really changes the amount of intellect and intellectual activity that's going on. The other thing that's interesting is in Leonardo's drawings associated with the fetus in, in uh, the uterus, he comments. And she puts there the soul, the composer of the body, that is the soul of the mother, which first composes in the womb, the shape of man, and in due time awakens the soul 
which is to be its inhabitant. So in one way, he's asking the question, when does intellect or consciousness go from the mother to the fetus? When does that happen? He also has almost a Darwinian type of concept, though human ingenuity by various in inventions with different instruments yields the same end. They will never devise an, an invention more beautiful than does nature because in her inventions, nothing is lacking and nothing is superfluous. This is my daughter and, uh, <clears throat> and Evie, one of my grandchildren. And it's really in a remarkable sort of concept related to the idea of Leonardo was thinking of what a marvelous sort of issue it is to have a child. And really the issue that it, he bothered with was how does this happen? How, how does this miraculous thing happen of the intellect, the consciousness going into the, the fetus? Now, we're going to go a little faster now, but basically Vesalius was really not very interested in the idea of where the soul is. He says, we were persuaded that this figure that included not only the three ventricles, but also as we let, we were led to believe, it displayed all the parts of the head, including the brain. So he never really looked very much for this idea. He was much more interested in, for example, in the anatomical compositions. Descartes believed that the soul was located in the pineal gland because of his concept that the body was some of machine. Thomas Willis was more important related to the idea that he was uh, involved with a group of, of chemists, researchers who believed that chemical rather than mechanical concepts were the essential part to be associated with brain function. This is the first microscopic image we have of a nerve cell. This is one of the more complex nerve cells in the nervous system called the Purkinje cell. These are the first pictures of it. Here we have Camilo Golgi's depiction of the reticulum of the brain. And, and Golgi believed that every single neuron was, was connected to the other neurons. And so we had a reticulum. Cajal, on the other hand, felt that every single neuron <coughs> was separate. It communicated through connections, synapses, et cetera, but they were separate. And obviously Cajal was, was, was correct in his assessment. The neuron is really considered to be the physiological unit. And so we have, if you look, if you look at the concept now, we have the brain, we have molecules and ions, synapses, microcircuits, dendritic trees, neurons, local circuits, integrated systems, behavioral systems. So is this it? Is this, is this what it's all about now? Where does love come from? Where, where does caring come from? Where does all the essential components that make us human come from? How do these systems make us what we are? You can stimulate the human brain. You can get all kinds of activity associated with motion and other things, but that doesn't really help us very much with the idea where the sort of concept of soul would be. This concept of love, concepts of other activities that we happen to have. Benfield felt that, that these, this important idea of consciousness really was outside of the cerebral cortex, was somewhere in the deep part of the brain. I can tell you, you can operate on humans awake. You can operate on them when they're doing computer programming, et cetera. But I have never, never really been able to sort of understand how that necessarily deals with the idea of consciousness, which part of the brain has to do with consciousness. Now I'm gonna move into another area very quickly here, just artificial intelligence. And the reason for this is that moving into artificial intelligence, that's really a branch of computer science. It really deals with simulated intellectual behavior in computers. Machine learning is just one of the domains of artificial intelligence that allows computer algorithms to learn patterns by studying data directly without being programmed. 
So there's artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks, deep learning, all these areas that, that people work with now associated with computers and computer intelligence. And this is important. And the reason it's important because one of the initial concepts related to consciousness related to the idea, if you look back, information comes in, there's sort of a, a global workspace that was basically called the blackboard and information is spread through the rest of the brain through this sort of idea. So the idea being that there was what is called a global workspace. And this theory argues that consciousness arises from a particular type of information processing related to concepts of artificial intelligence. So sensory and all kinds of other information involves small, small programs of data, which is shared and written on this blackboard. So our brain is a blackboard. On the blackboard, all the sensory information comes in and through a series of really artificial intelligence networks, they are placed on this blackboard. And consciousness emerges when the incoming sensory information, which is inscribed on such a blackboard is broadcast from the frontal and parietal processing centers to multiple cognitive systems throughout the brain. And when this process and this data uh, is stored, suddenly you become conscious. And you can think about it a little bit. You're sleeping, you're dreaming, but you're not conscious, but all kinds of activity is occurring. But if that dream gets to a certain type of excitement, then suddenly you may wake up. But the important part of this particular concept is that in this theory really predicts that future com computers can become conscious. Because if you get enough of these sensory systems, these sensory artificial intelligence sort of programming systems together, they will eventually wake up. So that's the one concept. So will computers replace humans conceptually? A number of individuals have, have wondered about the idea of, is the problem that computers will never become able to think? is that they will never be able to dream. Computers will never be able to dream. And so consciousness, instead of being off and on, is really a spectrum. And part of that spectrum is involved with dreaming and other things that are not easy to think that one could possibly put into a computer program. There's another theory, the other theory relates to what is called the integrated information theory. And this, is somewhat of a peculiar theory in the sense that it's derived from underlying interconnected structures and a single non-negative number called pi. And what this number means is it is an attempt to quantify consciousness. And if the system does not feel like anything to be, to be itself, it really isn't conscious. And the bigger the number, in other words, the more intrinsic power that number has, that makes that system more and more conscious. And because the brain has a very high neural complexity and therefore would have a high number, therefore it's conscious. In a, in a let's say an octopus that has a brain and then has a brain in each of its eight arms, it has a number, but it is not high enough to become conscious. And what's interesting about this particular theory, it really predict, predicts that a, simu, a sophisticated simulation of the brain running on computers cannot become conscious. The idea lies in the concept that consciousness cannot be programmed, but has to be built into the system. In other words, the, the idea that embryology, the brain developing, et cetera, uh, is a system that, that is inbuilt and therefore consciousness is a natural product of that particular system, not based on other aspects. So one of the issues that we have is how are we going to use computers to help humans create a better world? All of the medical students that are on this, this call will come in contact with individuals who are in what are called the persistent vegetative states. And what that means is if you see such an individual, take the time to look at them. They may look back at you 
you'll notice they may follow you in the room. They will sleep and awake. They may have other types of what we call almost vegetative types of states, but they don't appear to have content in their consciousness. So you can sort of feel that those particular individuals have some type of alertness, but they don't have content. So clearly there's a difference between content, which our brains have when they function normally, and another system in the brain which alerts us and keeps us in some type of alert system or associated with our environment. If you look at Leonardo's drawings and you look in the brain itself, you can see here that the, much of this area here related to uh, the nuclei that are present just above the uh, pituitary behind the lamina firm, terminalis in this area is where Leonardo feels that the, um, the soul will be located. It's not a bad guess. The other thing I wanted to talk about was the issue of the human genome. And the reason I bring this up is for two reasons. There are two systems that were developing the human genome. One was associated with uh, various uh, universities dealing with each individual chromosome. And then there was Venter who was using machines. And obviously Venter's machines have won. But both of these systems were available almost at exactly the same time, the data on these systems. And the hope would have been that they would be sort of put together and, and published in one article, in one major journal. It couldn't be done. So venture stuff was published in one and the other work was published in another. Now, one of the ideas we have now is that we know much of what <coughs> these chromosomes and the information of the genes on these chromosomes do but there's a large number of them that we still don't understand exactly what they do or how they interact. So potentially, is it possible that some of the, some of the genes involving consciousness are present in this area that we don't know at the present time? And what will the future hold if we start to learn? Phase lock 99%, link is stable. I have the first congruency. That may well be what the future operating looks like when we understand much more about some of these systems that are keeping us conscious and not conscious. Walter Penfield said, the problem of neurology is to understand man himself. Venter, this is the individual that used machines to deal with the genome, said the real challenge of human biology beyond the task of finding out how genes orchestrate the construction and maintenance of the marvelous mechanism of our bodies will lie ahead as we try to explain how our minds have come to organize thoughts sufficiently well to investigate our own existence. Leonardo says, what moves a man to abandon his home in town, leave his relatives and friends, going into country places over mountains and up valleys, if not for the natural beauty of the world? Piaget comments the principal goal of education in the school should be creating men and women who are capable of doing new things, not simply repeating what other generations have done. Men and women who are creative, inventive, discoverers, who can be critical and verify and not accept everything that they are offered. Leonardo said, it is a mediocre pupil who does not excel as master. I commented, I changed this a little bit saying that is a mediocre teacher whose pupils do not excel him or her. So the role of your teachers is to make sure that their students are able to move the, the concepts, the ideas, the understanding forward and make the place a better world. What a person leaves after them are the dreams that their name inspires and the works that made their name a symbol of admiration. The search goes on. Thank you very much. I'm open for all questions. 
Thank you, first and foremost. That was an incredible talk. They still did an hour, and uh, I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. Uh, we'll open the floor by just uh, using the microphone, uh, so we can hopefully have an interactive uh, discussion. So if anyone has questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself or raise the hand feature, and uh, we can moderate the chat. Yes, John. You have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? John, are you, have you unmuted yourself? I have, but I'm afraid I've got not got something working here. Sorry. Okay. Can you hear now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, I enjoyed your presentation very much. And one of the things that just struck me, I'm curious about, is when did you and Leonardo da Vinci uh, become intrigued? And where did this occur in relationship to your medical education and your going on into be a neurosurgeon? Well, when I, when I was in undergraduate um, uh, studies at Western, I was pretty well fascinated with the idea of creativity. You know, what, what makes creativity? What, what is the basis of creativity? And if you think overall, there's been three very large time periods where creativity was, was a part of the human uh, sort of genome. That was time of the Greeks, the Renaissance, and uh, really the time period. And if you, if you look at the time of the Greeks, that was associated with writing, the ability to write the Greek language and spread it that way. The Renaissance was associated with the idea that books were being published and therefore information could be spread in that way. And then we have the third large time period, which is really the internet and all the information that we have available to us now. So in one way, that, that was my thinking. One of my teachers at Western by the name of Favalka uh, had a course on, on, um, on creativity. And he believed that Mozart was the most creative person that had ever lived. And the reason for that happened to be that he felt that when you looked at Mozart's music, there were very few corrections as though the music just came right out of them. However, to pass that course, uh, you had to um, pick another individual who you felt was as creative or more creative than Havelka. And then you had to, to you know, sort of dispute with the professor in two particular time periods, uh, two essays, as to why you believe that your particular person was more creative than, uh, than Mozart. Now, I was taking this course when I was an intern. You know, I didn't do so well on my first attempt. So much of my, so much of my life has been attempting to be, do a little bit better. Now, it has gone to some extremes, as I'll show you. This is my library, which has about 8,000 books. The vast majority of them related to Leonardo. So you can see that I'm still trying to do a little bit better as far as that's concerned. Related to neurosurgery, you know, isn't it marvelous to think that we have this three pound sort of gelatinous, gelatinous object inside our skulls, which, which does an incredible thing. It, it takes all this information from the environment coming through our senses, allows us to integrate it, and allows memory to occur. I mean, it's an amazing thing that it allows memory to occur. And not only that, it allows us to dream. 
It allows us to believe in the future. It allows us to look at the past and integrate it into the present and into the future. And um, therefore, I, I basically felt that, that working on the brain was something that I would be interested in doing. And I have to say, the brain has, has fascinated me right from the first time I actually saw it. I saw it meeting and thinking that in, in this thing is the essence of this particular person. Now, the other thing I want to mention is one other thing, I, I, I over a thousand operations on patients awake. So I have a fair knowledge about that process. Every once in a while, it's easy to, to anesthetize the scalp. The brain has no fiber and no pain fibers. Why does a great, great interpreter of pain in the universe have no pain fibers? Why does that occur? I mean, think about it. This thing interprets pain continuously, but itself has no pain fibers. Why did that happen? Evolutionary, what, what's the value? What's the idea about that? Yeah, but every once in a while during these operations, individuals get stressed, as you may, may consider. And sometimes you have to stop the operation because people are so stressed, they're moving, they're beginning to move, and this is getting all concerned about what's happening, et cetera, and you stop. That's rare, but it happens. One of my last operations I did, um, this was happening to a patient, and I knew she was religious. And I said to her, why don't you pray? And she started praying. Very quickly, when you looked around the room, you could see the mouth of the anesthetist moving, all the nurses, the residents in the room, and she settled down completely. We carried on with the operation and did it. So do not, do not think that spirituality has nothing to do with human existence. It is an important sort of component of human existence. You can argue whether it's what you can argue about related to spirituality, but there's very there's something very special about spirituality that helps people, helps people get through stress, helps people get through operations. So do not count spirituality out of any equation that you have related to the human condition. So that's a long answer, but I think it's a, it's an appropriate one. For, Thank for you for answer. sharing that. And uh, I, I recall that Dr. Havelka had a great impact on myself during the uh, pre-medical years of my education. So that's very intriguing to have you mention him uh, as being a very interesting person in getting you in studying the creativity and learning how to become better. So that I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Yes, Chris. Uh, yeah, so thanks. That was a fascinating talk. Um, so a couple of things that I'm curious about is, the, um, so Descartes identified the pineal gland as the seat of the soul primarily because it's one of the most noticeable uh, solitary structures in the brain. So I was wondering if uh, da Vinci had any reflections on why the, there seemed to be two different aspects or two hemispheres of what would be the seat of the soul, as well as um, if you could comment on the three different um, aspects of the soul that were in the figures that he was pointing out that comes from Aristotle's tripartite soul. Right. I think um, Leonardo, I'm not sure, really sort of thought about the idea because he did he obviously did dissections. He did dissections involving the, um, the brain. One of the problems, however, is when you do a human dissection based on Modino's sort of description was in the first day, you would do the dissection of the abdomen. And you gotta remember that this was in a hot climate in Italy. So the first day, the dissection of the abdomen would occur. And the second day, you would have the chest and other organs of the chest would be dealt with. The third day would involve the brain. By the third day in a hot environment, in the bottom of, let's say, Santa Maria del Fiore Hospital, there was probably a little bit of 
putrefaction that was going on related to the brain. And therefore that's why he did some of the experiments, for example, with bovine brains. And so I think that related to the right and left part of the brain, I don't think he really was terribly worried about the fact that the brain had two sides. You know, conceptually we have two arms, we have two legs, we have two eyes. You know, so I think there was no particular issue about that. And since Leonardo thought that the eyes were one of the more important parts of our ability to uh, deal with our external environment, the fact that they were coming in sort of together and we had two sides probably sort of was not normal and natural to them. Uh, related to the three components, basically the, the idea being that, you know, the first information came into this sort of area that was in near the anterior part of the, of the third ventricle. And that was sort of a, an area where all the, all the nerves came into, emotions came into that area. Then somewhat behind that was an area which was associated with the idea of, of reasoning. And the cerebellum was going back and forth with the idea of memory. Now, the reason the cerebellum had become a big issue was that Galen in particular had seen that people were gladiators who were struck in the back of the head, if they survived, tended to have the loss of a lot of memory. Well, what happened in that situation was when the gladiator was struck in the back of the head, the, both frontal lobes were severely damaged and both temporal lobes would, may also have been damaged. So it was not being struck in the back of the head that, that caused the problem in the cerebellum, but the fact that the brain moved forward, striking the inner part of the brain, damaging the anterior parts of both the temporal lobes and sometimes the frontal lobes that resulted in this problem with memory. So that's how the memory got placed in the back of the head in the cerebellar region. So that was conceptually based on experiments that, well, not experiments so much, but at least the ability of Galen to, to have information related to those types of injuries. So those, that would be the way I would put that together from, from Leonardo's point of view. The problem with Leonardo was that he sort of reached an end. You know, he was able to sort of have the, see the brain, think that was the important part related to the idea of that was where, you know, the central communal was. He was able to, to try to locate it as best as he could. Uh, he was then able to show what the ventricles looked like for the very first time. And that obviously using his sculptural ability was he was able to do that. He was able to see all the nerves and put that all together and trying to conceptualize everything. But then he was stuck. He was stuck because he didn't have the other information that he would have needed to go on. You know, for example, microscopes and other information to get inside the brain and find out that there are neurons, et cetera. And that didn't happen for about two or 300 years later. So he was really, he had sort of reached a point where he couldn't go any further and he did the best that he could with what he had available to him. Yeah, very interesting, thank you. Does that help? Matthew. Yes, hi. Thank you so much for the very interesting talk. So my question, maybe it's a bit more broad. Uh, I noticed on one of your slides, you had a bit of a definition of consciousness. Um, and my understanding was that if consciousness is defined as the subjective experience associated with existence, in other words, it is like something to be you. Uh, do you think that it is possible to objectively prove that this subjective experience exists in someone or something? And if not, would it be impossible then to find a source? You're getting into some difficult questions. <laughs> to say the least. What, what, you know, from a neurosurgeon's perspective, first, clarity content is, is important because if you don't have content in your brain, you know, you're left in some type of persistent vegetative state. So you can be, you know, you can be alert, you can be sort of alive, people can watch your eyes move around and stuff, but you have no content. So to my understanding, that really isn't, I mean, you're somewhere on the spectrum of consciousness, but you're clearly not conscious to what we expect as conscious. Now, I've always felt that if you wanna be, if you're conscious, that means two things. That means that you can express love and you can receive love. So if you have that particular two, two bits of information, you can express love to some other being and you can 
somehow receive love and know that you're receiving love. And uh, you can say, love, what is love? Well, love is some type of sensory sort of system that we, that we feel as, um, uh, as love. So if you have those two things, then probably you have some type of consciousness. Now, the question is, as I mentioned in the talk, I'm a little confused. Where the hell is love? Where is it? I've stimulated the brain. I've caught all kinds of places out of the brain. I'm not sure I, I have an answer to that question. There's some type of system running inside of our brain that allows that to happen. Now you can argue, you can say, what, what people tell me is, heck, the reason you have love is our species has to continue to exist. Therefore, genetics are such that you have to have love so you can have reproduction and therefore you can have the existence of the species. Okay, I heard, well, that's a good argument. Then I think one of my teacher's wife was dying with Alzheimer's. When you saw him feeding her, taking care of her, I don't know how that has to do with reproduction. I don't know how that has to do with the idea that we want to continue our species. There is something more intrinsic in that that is different. It is different than this idea that we just want to increase our species. Now, clearly, that's one goal, but there's something different. We've evolved something different than, let's say, most other animals have involved. Now, clearly, animals have some perception of love, whatever that is. But we as humans have, you know, have we've because a number of the systems we have, when you integrate them together, there is some type of special feeling you get when you are associated with love. And of course that's true, serotonin, et cetera. You can argue all that, that type of, of, of information related to the ideas of of uh, various types of levels of various uh, substances that allow you to be happy or not happy. But still, it's, it's a little interesting. The second thing I will tell you is my son is a theoretical physicist. And when we talk about ions and receptors and all that stuff, he looks at me like I'm sort of strange. He says, well, dad, it's all atoms that are moving. They're just atoms that are moving together and sharing and sharing your electrons. And, and through that sharing of electrons and other sort of activities, they're creating your molecules, you're creating your synapses, you're, they're creating the whole system. So you're at, a, you're at a wrong level. You know, there's something much more intrinsic, much lower down that's associated with, with uh, let's say some of the things we're talking about. So, the, the long answer to the question is, I have no idea. The short answer is, um, I think it's something to be explored. And I would hope that some of these individuals who are on the call will, will sort of begin to think about this. And maybe we can have a little bit more enlightenment in the future as to what, what really, where is love and how does love sort of exist in that three pound sort of pulsating sort of object we have inside of our skull. And how do we express it and how do we get it in from that aspect. I know that doesn't really answer your question, but that's the best I can do right now. Thank you very much. Nikki. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Uh, I myself have been a huge fan of Da Vinci for a very, very long time. I uh, read his biography by Walter Isaacson. And so I was very excited to join the Zoom call today. Uh, so I particularly really enjoy um, his work, The Vitruvian Man. And I'm not sure if the other participants are familiar with that drawing, but it was created at a time where there was a lot of debate about spirituality, but also about mathematics and squaring a circle, I believe. And Da Vinci brilliantly brought all these concepts together and created the Vitruvian man. And uh, there's this beautiful philosophy behind it um, about spirituality. And I was wondering if you had any insight or wanted to elaborate about basically that man was at the center of the universe and he had the ability to climb up this ladder and behave like God, 
or climb down and behave, you know, like animals. Um, I was wondering if you had any insight on that sketch in particular and just the, the mathematics and the religion and everything that he brought together in that sketch and why it became so iconic and is actually, I believe, on the one euro coin for Italy. Right. Well, if you ever have the time to go to Venice, go to the Academia. And that particular drawing is held in Venice at the Academy. And every three to five years, that particular drawing is out and you can see it in its reality. And when you actually see it live, you get the impression that Leonardo has spent a great deal of time putting that drawing together. And the circle and the square and that aspect of it. I think in a way he's trying to conceptualize something that, that is associated with the human condition. You know, that there's, you know, the arms are out, the legs are out, et cetera. But there's something, you know, the idea of the microcosm and the macrocosm and the microcosm being man, he, the man being the center of, of the microcosm of this large universe that would be the macrocosm. So in one way, I think that's, that's part of that, that picture from that idea. And then I think, you know, we can talk a lot about Leonardo's one drawing or another drawing, etc. But I think the major way I found it useful is to, to sort of put these in, in sort of a, a perspective or let's say phases of his thinking. Leonardo changed his mind uh, when he did, for example, experiments and he found, for example, what someone had written in a book wasn't true. And he criticizes people all the time. He'll say that, you know, Vincina said this, but I have found that that is not true. And so it, part of it is, you know, this, this idea that he was always sort of looking for things and trying to find things. He did very few paintings, for example. Vasari says that, you know, he, you know, he, he, Vasari tells a story where Leonardo was supposed to do a painting. And after you did a painting, you usually put a var varnish on the painting to keep it from cracking, for example. And Leonardo started to think of why does that happen? And then he starts thinking about, well, if I put a little bit more and more varnish here, a little less there, I get different light into the painting, which means different reflection and further it's different color. And then he gets completely absorbed the varnish. And the reason he gets absorbed with the idea of the varnish is because his intellect makes it important for him to try to understand how this really works. And I think that's the other thing about Leonardo. He, he is the curiosity as far as he can, you know, using books, using his own experiments, using other ideas, using other, asking people about things, trying to get as much information as he possibly can about various aspects. Now, Freud, Freud only psychoanalyzed one artist, really, and that was Leonardo da Vinci. And he tried to work out why Leonardo was productive. Why was he creative? And there's, you know, if you have time to read Freud's <clears throat> sort of um, attempt at dissecting creativity of the creativity of Leonardo, it, he comments that, you know, Leonardo was born out of wedlock. His mother was probably 15 or 16 years old. She was, um, she had a little, she had a little brother. She uh, didn't appear to have a mother or father. Uh, she was, you know, she was impregnated by Leonardo's father. Uh, she was then moved into a uh, place outside of Vinci, a place called Anciano, where she gave birth. She took care of Leonardo for probably two or three years, wonderful family life probably at that time period. And then his mother decided to get married to another individual. And I suspect that other individual didn't like the idea, was sort of torn away from his mother and went to live with his father's family. And um, his father had very little interest in him. His, grandma, his grandmother and grandfather obviously thought it was nice to have him around. But he had an uncle, his uncle, 
and his uncle, his name was Francesco. And his uncle uh, wasn't in the law sort of group that his father was. His father was a lawyer, and his grand, his great grandfather was a lawyer too. But his, but Francesco liked the farm, liked to deal with things. It was associated with nature, and that's probably where Leonardo learned a lot of stuff. You know, a lot about nature, a lot about birds, a lot about other aspects of things. Uh, and Leonardo became a vegetarian and was a vegetarian. And part of that may have been related to the fact of, you know, not wanting to be associated with, with killing animals. And when Francesco died, he didn't give money to any of her. He didn't give any money of, of his estate to any of the other, um, let's say, uh, nephews and nieces that he had, only to Leonardo. So clearly, again, you can see how these, um, these aspects of his bringing up, according to Freud, um, influences his ability to interact with people and interested his ability in his ability to interact with nature. Um, and um, I think that, you know, you can argue about it one way or the other, but it is an interesting exploration and well worth the read if you have the time to do so sometime. Other questions? Yes, Pooja. Thank you for wonderful talk. First of all, I, I personally like the Leonardo part and the consciousness part because it is the consciousness which, which I have never been able to wrap my head around till now. <laughs> but my question is, you, you asked, you, you said that uh, where the love or care comes from. So I want to ask, what do you think about this idea that it can be just the emergent behavior or emergent property of the matter arranged in a certain way? <clears throat> well, you know, the questions would be, um, if our brain is a series of, let's say, algorithms that are running on a continuous basis, um, and uh, those algorithms have, are associated with deep learning, in other words, you know, they're not programmed, or at least some of them are not programmed. Obviously, there are programs. I mean, your heart is beating, you know, you're every, there's a whole bunch of programmed, you know, uh, artificial intelligence types of, uh, of systems that are working in, in your body all the time. Uh, and they're, they're continually working and adjusting, et cetera. But then there are these other ones that are not doing that, that are able to sort of put in new information. Uh, and therefore, they have to be almost be like, you know, you can think of it that they, they are ones that where you, as you're learning as a child, um, you know, your parents will, will tell you something. And therefore, that helps you get information in, in a structured way. But there also is the other deep learning types of uh, situations where, for example, you have never known how to deal with a particular situation and therefore it occurs and therefore a bunch of algorithms start thinking, well, if this happens to you again, if this feeling of love happens to you again, this is how you react. This feeling of, of let's say unhappiness, this is how you react. And so it's sort of a bunch of algorithms working at a bunch of different uh, levels that are involved in the, in the human brain. I personally am a little concerned and I, I do a lot of work in artificial intelligence, but you know the artificial intelligence systems are better than humans at many, many things. Much, much better than humans at many, many things. And so potentially, if this is true, that it is a blackboard that we have in our brain and all these systems are on this large blackboard, and if you put enough of them together, like, you know, for example, if you're sleeping and suddenly, you know, you wake up because a dream has bothered you, is that what's going to, is that going to happen with computers? If you put enough of these algorithms running through computers that eventually they will just wake up. And if they wake up, you know, there's lots of sort of science fiction about this, but they must, if they woke up and looked at what we do to the world, I mean, we should, you know, why should we exist as humans? If they have the ability, if they get the ability to build themselves without us. And one way we're doing that, you know, is we, we use humans less and less and less, we use machines more and more and more. You have the potential of having machines being able to build themselves 
when machines build themselves, you know, then you have these other issues that you have to deal with related to whether they'll become, you know, will they become conscious or not. So I think there's a lot of people, there's a number of scientists who are very concerned about this idea of putting artificial intelligence into the machine type of world, especially related, you know, like tanks run themselves, drones can run themselves, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so I don't know what the world's going to look like in a hundred years, but it's not going to be like it is now, not at all. So you are going to be the ones who are going to have to go through this time period and make an adjustment in yourselves to how you want the world to be and um, how to make it a kinder world. Now, there may be the possibility that there's going to be some type of a human machine inter inter interface. And that will start with individuals, for example, that have a paralysis and you'll be able to put, you know, a number of areas on the cortex of the motor, motor area, which they're already doing. And the individual is going to be able to, let's say, think uh, that I want to move my arm. And let's say that individual doesn't have an arm, but has an uh, a artificial arm. And the, therefore, the by the mind itself, they'll move this artificial arm. And so you can see how this can get more and more complex that the individual um, then becomes part human and part machine. And then, you know, maybe that's the hybrid. We'll go through a hybrid. I have difficulty with the other concept, but there may be something for example, very, you know, what's so special about the human brain that it should be conscious? What is so special about it? I mean, it's being made up of atoms, it's made up of, of electrons, it's made up of neutrons, just like every other object in the universe. But well, why is it so special? Why can't it? Why can't consciousness occur in other systems that are also made up of atoms, also made up of electrons, etc.? So, it's a, it's a very complicated, we're in a complicated interface right now. You're going to see things happen in the next five or 10 years that is going to blow your mind, really, literally. There's going to be all kinds of unbelievable things coming out of the scientific labs associated with artificial intelligence and brain-machine interaction. And then what we're going to have to decide is how far do we let these things go? And what is the danger of them? It's like... It's like atomic energy in a way, you know, we, uh, we, you have atomic energy, it's very good, it makes electricity, et cetera, but it also makes atomic bombs. So, well, humans have not been able to regulate themselves very well over time, that's for sure. That's for sure. My hope is that, that your, your time periods, of the, especially the young who are medical students and other individuals, uh, will do better than we've done. I would hope that we can evolve beyond war. Give me a break. Can we not evolve beyond war? Jesus, really? Have we not got this within us? And if we don't, if you as young people don't change it, it will continue to the end of time until there's not a human left on the surface of the planet. So somehow we have to evolve beyond this. It just can't keep going on. Because, you know, if we don't kill ourselves by, uh, by polluting the planet, can you imagine what a computer would say what we've done to the planet so far? <laughs> Just imagine what they would think if they got all the data. And they can get all the data. You put a big computer and get it, they can get all the data. To give you an idea, when we're doing, in our lab, when we're doing, let's say, work associated with uh, operative procedure, uh, we can get 6,000 bits of data on how your arms are moving together, 6,000. And that's just the beginning. We can get many more than that. We can figure out every single movement that you're making with your hands, every acceleration, deceleration, tremor, everything. We can reconstruct the whole procedure. And that's because we've got artificial intelligence. So imagine what eventually what may happen with artificial intelligence as far as communities, et cetera. The only thing is we're chaotic as humans. We're very chaotic. We, we, we're, we don't, we're not predictable. And that's, that's one of the problems. That may be why we're going to survive, that we're completely unpredictable. Because then the, then the computers are not going to be able to deal with that. And I also have a problem of, 
does anybody think in this group that's on that we are going to be able to have computers that dream? How does, how is that gonna happen? You know, dreaming is some part, dreaming, you know, your brain uses as much energy in the night as it does during the day. And you're, you're coding all kinds of memory that you had during the day at night. So that's one reason that that's happening. But also there's the numbers of algorithms that are, that are sort of coming forward during, your, during the nighttime. And that's when you're sleeping. That's when you know, information comes up in your front lobes. And you, you, can hear, you can hear things during your dream. You can see things during your dream. Imagine the complexity that's going on in a dream. And I'm not sure you'll be able to program a computer to do that. It's just maybe too complex, but speculation, of course. Yes, you're Esteban. You want me to get off the line? <laughs> well, um, I can ask the questions, but we have two other people. Um, I mean, my question can wait. I think Ariel and uh, Abby. So maybe they can go first, actually. And then if there's time, I'll ask. If not, that's okay. All right, Ariel. Okay. Yeah, first, I want to say thank you so much for such an interesting talk. Uh, the last question you answered started. Uh, talking about love. And I think uh, in that same vein, I'm interested um, in how the Egyptians had this idea of what the heart did and that it housed uh, passions and some kind of thing we would call today an intellectual uh, drive. But we still have this kind of uh, idea that the heart, at least in metaphorically, it has some kind of uh, passion or uh, energy that, that we can associate with it. I'm wondering, uh, I was really interested how you showed that Leonardo left it blank, what he wrote in that particular text, what he thought the heart was. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts on what he actually thought it did? I know that uh, like there were some developments in cardiovascular physiology and anatomists like William Harvey would discover after him uh, you know, the whole detail of like the heart pumping blood, but like, what did he think that the heart did, uh, Leonardo? He thought it was a pump. That was the final decision. He thought it was an involuntary motion involving the pump. Now that didn't mean he didn't think it was a marvelous organ. You know, for example, he, he, he developed uh, models whereby he would have, you know, he would have, he would take out the valves of the heart, for example, the auric valve, put them on the end of a, a blown sort of aorta that he would blow, put all kinds of colored, sort of material through that particular valve, see how the ed 80s formed. That didn't, that didn't occur again for three, 400 years after Leonardo uh, did it. So, you know, he, again, it just shows you his, his interest in, in, in dealing with these, these complicated problems. Um, and the heart to him was a very complicated problem. You know, I think, I mean, to me, it's still a complicated, now we can replace it within someone else's heart and probably, very soon we'll be replacing it with, with um, various animals that, that have been programmed rejection. Uh, but it is interesting that we have not really been able to, to deal with the mechanical heart very effectively. And uh, so there probably are some limits to our, to our understanding of heart function. But um, overall, I think that the problem a little bit is Aristotle was so, so dominant in his thinking that the whole idea of the heart has really revolved around, you know, Valentine's Day and et cetera, et cetera. The second thing is if you get emotional, what happens to your heart is actually strikes the in, inner part of your, of your sternum. And that gives your chest this abnormal feeling which probably translate to some type of other feeling that the brain deals with. And so despite the fact that it's beating, if it's beating really fast, and I'm sure if it's beating in some type of, you know, emotional love life, love like uh, experience, uh, there's multiple parts of it that are associated maybe with, with the heart in some way. Uh, and the brain, you know, it's, it's like a hybrid, you know, the brain and the heart sort of maybe have some things that work together one way and the other. Not a really good answer, but the best answer. You know, I can't believe how little we, we know. We know so little. We think we know stuff. 
what I can tell you in my, you know, 40 years working on, on let's say brain tumors, which I have done, we know so, so little. And uh, let's hope that uh, we know more and more over time, but you know, there's so, you know, there's certain questions that we just, we, we can deal with simple things. We can put a bone back together with a bunch of screws and plate and everything. You know, we can do all kinds of stuff like that. It works quite well. But when it gets down to more complex issues like, you know, mental disease, uh, all that, uh, it's, it's a much more complicated issue. And that's because it happens to involve the brain and receptors in the brain and various aspects of the brain function. We just, we just don't know enough about how the brain works. And uh, as my son says, you, you know, you guys, you know, you're not talking about, about the right things. You're not talking about the atoms and all the rest of it that happen in, in the brain that are somehow the structural basis of, of, the, of the whole idea of, of consciousness. Nikki. Sorry, I got, I got disconnected, so <laughs> I just re-entered. Um, I had two questions. I'm not sure if we have time to answer them both, but one was, uh, I have looked, like I previously said, very extensively into Da Vinci and always been a big fan. So excited to speak to you about him because you clearly have that same, um, you know, knowledge base or much greater knowledge base than I do in regards to him. But when I would study him and I had looked into his history, I saw that the thing that I think propelled him the most was just this like innate curiosity, curiosity for absolutely everything, which I think is such a beautiful quality, an essential quality for human beings to advance. But especially in medical studies, you have to stay curious. You have to know that there's always more to know and so you have to keep searching. And I was wondering specifically in your line of work of surgery, um, of course there's training, there's expertise, there's refining your skills, but then there's this level of you reach that point where you become so competent and you have the confidence, but where's that fine line between when you're literally cutting someone up and you have the confidence to do that and you hope you, know, you get the best outcome. And at which point does it shift over into ego because of course that exists in medicine unfortunately unfortunately and um you know we were talking about consciousness and we're talking about freud and so of course ego comes up and i wonder just as a surgeon and as someone who is very respected in the field um what are your thoughts on that so curiosity is one thing to propel us forward but how do you toe the line between being confident in your surgical pursuits and not allowing ego to take over you have to be incredibly humble. And the reason I say that is you can do the, the best operation that can be done. And then the patient will die from an infection or a heart attack or a pulmonary embolus. And so, you know, we, you know, we're part of, you know, a group of, of individuals and neurosurgeons, let's say, and other types of surgeons who develop a certain number of skills. And we, you know, I've always, I've always told people who are, if you're, if you're a medical student on the, on this particular call, there's one really big question you have to deal with. And that big question is, do I cut into the human body or not? That is a really big question you have to deal with somewhere around end of second and third year. Because if you cut into the human body, that's a completely different aspect of it. I mean, you put a scalpel in your hand and you take that scalpel and you cut open the body, and the abdomen and the leg, wherever, and you try to do something related to that. Using, using those technical skills. That's not to mean that people who do, for example, and geography and other things don't have technical skills, but it's a little different. Uh, it's not quite the same. Uh, for example, doing an angiogram of a carotid artery is not like, you know, sort of dealing with carotid and a directomy. They're somewhat different. So I think over my lifetime, as I got older, I got more and more humble. And um, I tried to push the envelope sometimes further than I should have. Patients died. Now, sometimes when you push the envelope further, things worked out quite well. And so the next time you push it even further, and then you push it even further, 
And then at some point you overextend and the patient ends up with a hemiparesis or ends up with a cognitive problem, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why we started, you know, we spend a lot of our time with awake patients because, you know, you can test intellectual function while you're doing the operation. You obviously can te test motor function. You can test speech. You can inspect all kinds of things when the patient's awake because some of our, you know, our technology does not allow us to assess all that, especially if the brain has been distorted by, let's say, an object in the brain, which would be a tumor. The only thing I can tell you is if you're a surgeon, surgeon try to be humble. Because if you're humble, then you can, um, then you'll get through each day a little bit better. Uh, the second thing is I've done wake operations on children that have been six years old, eight years old. How can you do that? How can you do that? How can you operate a kid that's six or eight years old for five hours, seven hours, et cetera? How do you do that? Well, you do that because the child believes that you're in a partnership. And that partnership is you and the child or you and the adult, whatever you're doing, you're doing this together. And that's another thing I think in the medical system we have to sort of work on. This is a partnership between a physician and a patient and a family and a society. And if we don't deal with that partnership properly, what will happen is we'll just become technicians that's all. And I tell you, being a technician is not exactly what I want to be. I want to be someone who's part of a, part of a family of, of physicians whose goal is to make the world a little bit better for that particular patient, for that particular disease, for that particular sort of environment. So I think that maybe if we do our best to remember that, that we're only part of a very you know, big arc, uh, and uh, if we if we deal with that, I think it be, it works out better. I'll tell you a story, not a not a story, but reality. You operate on a let's say a young woman. One of the things we do is we almost cut no hair. Why do we do that? Well, we do that because if you cut hair, especially with children females in particular, there is a you know, psychological problem associated with that at times, not always, of course, but at times. And so you, you try to decrease that particular stress from, from that, that situation. And then, for example, let's say you're operating on, on someone who's, let's say, 20 some odd years old, happens to be, let's say, a woman. And right after the operation, you know, the next morning you go in as a surgeon, and you say, well, how are you? And they say, well, I'm, I'm good. I said, well, what I would do is I would talk with the nurses taking care of her. And I would say, well, get her to put her music, get her to put her lipstick on, you know, get her to, to, you know, get dressed up, get her to, you know, put makeup on or whatever she wants to do. And what's amazing is how when other people come into the room and they see your patient with the lipstick, with the makeup, with no haircut or anything like that. It's, it's an incredible thing to make that patient feel better and do better. I mean, that's the secret of, of being a physician. Learn things that help people and you don't learn them all the time from your teachers. Sometimes you have to learn them yourself, but there's all kinds of secrets involving taking care of patients. Another secret I will give you if you have a patient in hospital that you're taking care of, talk to the nurse that's taking care of that patient, especially if they're sick, and just make sure that that you that you have this feeling uh, that that you care about that patient, and ask that nurse, you know, to you know drop in and see that patient or do this or do that, and. What happens in that situation is, again, you make this bond between yourself, the nurse, the patient, you begin to be involved in this, this triumvirate of individuals who, who are involved in the care. And I can tell you, you know the person that I like the most in a hospital? Who do you think it is? It's the cleaners. It's the cleaners. If they don't clean properly, 
it doesn't matter what you do, your patients will die with infections. That's reality. That's no game. That's reality. So when I go by a cleaner, I thank them. Because they're doing something very special. Just like everybody else. So try this humble thing. Try to keep it in some type of control. This feeling of, you know, I mean, you can call it godliness or whatever. It's, it's, it's just foolishness. Your patients will not do well if that's your, the way you approach the world. Try to sort of be part of this, this healing community. And uh, humility is a very important part of that. Very important part. And the second thing, I'll give, I'll give you a sign, one more sign, Saman. Try to talk with your patients. Try to talk with them. Listen to them. You'll learn all kinds of incredible stories. It's really hard because they're, you're rushing all the time, et cetera, but try to talk with them. Sit on the end of the bed and talk with them. It's incredible how much they'll get better in that situation. And if they're dying, even more, because people are left alone when they die. And one of your roles is to help them through the door. That's not the important role that you have. As a neurosurgeon, I've seen the door open too, too many times. All I could do was help them through. One more thing, so, I mean, Abby, you had a question on it. I think I should answer it because I, I should have, uh, I should have done that. Yes, Professor, I had the privilege of listening to a similar talk before, so it's my second time. But this is much deeper than the the previous one. You you really, because at the end of the previous talk, our question was, can AI stream? But here in this talk, this is the beginning. So I see it as a continuation. So thank you for that. And the way you're describing the, the physician-patient relationship, it, I don't see a difference between that and the, the mother-child relationship from the way you spoke. In fact, in the beginning of the, the lecture, when you showed the, the lamb's heart, I was thinking of the, the mother's womb, which brings me to the question. And you asked, can AI dream? You know, where do we put AI creativity dreams, this childlike state, where, where do we draw the line to all that? So I have a question for you. Do you think perhaps it could be simulating not a childlike brain with an AI, but perhaps a maternal fetus system in AI? And what would Da Vinci say to that in terms of the emergence of consciousness and love? Well, if we go back, if we go back to the idea of um, consciousness going, you know, from the from the mother to the to the child, I'm a, you know, what's interesting to me is how does a sperm and ovum get together, and those two sort of structures create, first of all, a very complex being. And second, somehow are able to transfer consciousness. I mean, what is present in those chromosomes that you get from your mom and your dad that, that, that are able to produce consciousness? What, what is there that allows that to happen? Because it has to be there. I mean, all of us exist because of that. An ovum and a sperm getting together. And we are conscious. So, you know, there's something very, you know, there, there's something that we don't understand in that aspect of that. The other thing that was interesting when I've talked to, you know, obstetricians and people who deal with this, you know, you can have uh, novum, which is, which is fertilized, divide into two and have two perfectly the same, you know, identical twins. It will divide again and you can have four, but then, something turns off 
something turns off and you can't have eight who are identical twins. So somewhere in the system, there's a turn off switch. Interesting. Yes, man. I guess I guess this is enough for night. Is that is that? <laughs> no, no. I have a question too. That's, that is never enough. This is uh, almost like a metaphysical now realm. We went from the Q and A to that. Um, I want to revert it back to the the Ming theme. So one of the questions that I had when we were presenting the slides is really the relationship between the scientists and artists. So we know that da Vinci uh, was the first to depict the anatomically correct spine and also liver cirrhosis. And then you sort of alluded to uh, uh, Camilla Golgi, but uh, his competitor, uh, uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, he was a very, very uh, brilliant uh, artist and neuroanatomist. And, and he was the one who essentially refuted this idea of the reticular model that the whole brain is one blob of information, everything is connected. And he was the one who presented the neuro doctrine. He was also a great artist. The question that I have for you is, do you think it would have been possible for both of these figures and those of that level to have made scientific discoveries had they not been great artists? What do you see that relationship to be? I think, I think that artists sometimes have the ability to see things in a way that other individuals do not. And that may be something that's that's inbuilt in their genetics. You know, there are certain individuals, for example, that can stop time. For example, you get about 25 or so sort of images every second of an object. And they go back to your occipital lobe and they're, they're coded. Some people can actually stop, seem to be able to almost stop those and see them in line. So we have all kinds of variations. We call them mutations if you want or whatever. So we have all kinds of different people who have all kinds of different ability. The other thing, if you look at children, for example, with autism, some of these children have incredible skill sets and uh, abilities. And so certain parts of the brain has, has been very well developed and other parts of the brain has not. Their interpersonal skills and other things. So obviously, um, different individuals have different abilities. Um, I've always been interested in Velka's concept, though, that, that Mozart was the most creative person that had ever lived. Because he, you know, you know at age five or whatever, he, he was composing his old concertos and things like that. But also the idea that he didn't, he didn't tend to make, you know, he just wrote it. Obviously, he made some changes, but if you look at Beethoven and you look at some of Brahms, you know, they're changing their music all the time, making it this and making it. Well, Mozart didn't do that. He just, this is it. This is, this is it. And in one way, you know, sometimes our, our you know, autistic children are like that. I mean, they, this is it. This is how the world should be, sort of idea. They have one idea, and this is how it is. So, in, in one way, I, I, um, it, is, it is truly amazing. Uh, the human brain's ability to produce individuals of multiple different types and different ideas and different concepts. And, uh, and uh, we probably we need artists sometimes to um, conceptualize uh, some of our thinking and some of our ideas. And, um, you know, what's interesting is one of, one of the, one of the uh, two, uh, two uh, essays I did for uh, Havelka related to vision and, and what happens when you, you know, artistically, when you see an object or you see a painting. Um, if that painting uh, comes into your sensory information and then how much of your brain lights up, how many algorithms are activated by that particular painting? And it's the same thing with music, you know, how much, how much is, is activated? And I think if you can activate multiple areas of people's brains by your art and by your music, that probably is a very special, um, let's say, gift that artists and musicians have. And um, that's, that's the fascinating part, that they have that ability to, to, to really light up your, light up your algorithms and uh, have you uh, 
have you have joy from listening to you know various you know uh, music of various sorts and um, it saddens me in a way that um, that we don't have more music in medical school and more other types of areas in medical school to, to sort of broaden your your ability to sort of uh, understand the world a little bit more. The music can be very useful. You know, for example, when patients are dying, <clears throat> it's, it's very useful to have music playing beside them, the, the music that they really like. It again, helps them go through the door. It does, no question, helps them. So there is something special about music. Thank you, it's a brilliant answer. Other questions? Now I know I've kept you here for a long, long time, but I think these, these questions that you're answering, I have very little answer to them. But I think the fact that you've asked the questions means that you're at least thinking that there's possibly an answer out there somewhere. So the fact that there is possible an answer out there is a very refreshing sort of thought. And my hope is that some of you will, you know, make a few steps towards that. You know, the world, you know, what we're all trying to do is build this wall of knowledge and everybody gets to put in a brick or part of a brick or whatever. And if, you, you know, some bricks are larger than others, but every brick is important, every single one. So whatever your brick happens to be, you know, put it together, add a little poetry if you can on the side so you can add to the poetry of the world too. All right, thank you very much. I think Nikki has a question, but I think, you still have one question, Nikki? I do, I'm gonna to try to keep it short, but I feel like it'll open a whole brand new discussion, but you can answer it as, as, as much as you would like, because I know it's uh, the, the discussion has gone on, but it's been so enjoyable. So you had mentioned that you're, um, son was a, I believe, a theoretical physicist, right. I think. And we were speaking about consciousness. And um, of course, it's so difficult to capture where it is if we're trying to, you know, uh, attach it to like a tangible organ of some sort. But um, what about the concept of quantum entanglement? Because consciousness, I think, uh, and love and actually psychologists and philosophers and physicists have been speaking about that for quite some time now about this idea of um, quantum entanglement, which Einstein, I think, didn't believe in. I think he, and then changed his mind and called it spooky uh, distance.